Welcome to the British Library. My name's Bea Rolat and I work here in the cultural events team. I'm at the entrance of our brand new exhibition, Breaking the News. It's just opened and you can book online. Tonight is the first event in our season of events around news. Um, and it's about press freedom, the freedom that underpins all others, that Nelson Mandela referred to as the lifeblood of any democracy. And to explore the related themes, we've got a stellar panel for you. And the chair is the distinguished journalist, Isabel Hilton. Isabel has had a career that's taken her all over the world. And when I was a baby journalist in BBC World Service, she was an absolute icon to me and many others. During this event, you can post your questions in the box below. You can donate to the British Library. Um, you can give us feedback and you can also buy Jacob's book, Free speech, a history from Socrates to social media. And after you've seen him speak, I'm sure you'll be ready to buy that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm handing you over to Isabel. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the wonderful invitation for, to, to be part of this event, and also for the pleasure of having a sneak preview of the exhibition itself last night, which I found really interesting. And I hope that anyone who's within striking distance of London or any of the regional centres will be able to visit. Um, it, it certainly, for me, it put into perspective um, a number of issues that we'll be talking about, but, but also things that we think of as rather contemporary. It turns out they have rather deep roots. I mean, obviously, things like how you cover a war is, is, a, is a, a long running uh, issue, but personal scandal, hideous crime, leaked private papers, fake news, turns out that they all have a very long history. And even the challenge of new technology isn't really new. So we're here to talk about that fundamental issue. Uh, of press freedom, um, which Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines as the right of newspapers, magazines to report news without being controlled by government. And I don't disagree with that. Um, I'm not sure that it tells the whole story, though. There are some fundamental questions about what news is, news about what, news from what angle, with which reader in mind, and whose news. If the press is only telling us the story of a narrow section of society, what is this freedom being used for? And is it a lack of freedom for those whose lives and concerns are not reported? Does the right to freedom also carry duties, obligations? And if so, how should these be defined? How should they be policed? And again, by whom? And what about ownership and transparency, unseen influences, accountability? Should we care who owns our media? Should we follow the money and wonder, when someone buys a newspaper, what exactly are they buying? So should we set rules? And if so, what should they be? Are there boundaries that even a free press shouldn't cross? So how free is the UK press in any event? We have an Official Secrets Act, we have an Anti-Defamation Act, and there's a whole noisy universe of social media with its shouting and its dark actors, its manipulation of emotion under the guise of news and supposedly free speech. So we have a lot to talk about. And fortunately, we have a wonderful panel for this evening's discussion. So let me introduce them. The longer bios are on the website. And if we went into all their collective achievements, we would be here for quite a while. So very briefly, Inaya Folarin Iman is a writer and a broadcaster. She's the creator and host of The Discussion, which is a weekly ideas, uh, culture and politics show on GB News. She's also the founder and director of the Equiano Project, which describes itself as a forum for freedom of speech and open dialogue on race, identity, and culture. Jacob Mchangama is the author of Free Speech, of, as, as we've heard, Free Speech, A Global History from Socrates to Social Media, um, which I have been reading with great interest and I warmly recommend it. Um, he's a lawyer, he's a human rights advocate and a think tank founder, and he's written for many national and international outlets and continues to do so. Mark Thompson is co-chair with, uh, with Maria Ressa, the Nobel laureate, 
at the International Fund for Public Interest Media. He has had a very distinguished career as Director General of the BBC for eight years, then CEO and President of the New York Times, where he had a great effect. And he's currently also Chair of Ancestry.com and Deputy Chair of the Royal Shakespeare Company. So a very warm welcome to our panel, a very warm welcome to all of you online. Um, and just so we see if we're starting from the same baseline, um, beginning with you, Jacob, I wonder if you could just define press freedom for me and, and tell us why you think it matters. Well, actually, I think press freedom is really only a, uh, a subspecies of a larger freedom, which is, which is free speech or freedom of expression. Uh, and and the, the roots of, of that are, are very ancient, deep and sprawling, going all the way back to to ancient Athens and the and the democracy there, which distinguished itself from 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 other contemporary civilizations by being by their standards uh, rather equal uh, and, and an emphasis on, on freedom. So all freeborn male citizens had a voice in, in public uh, affairs, and there was a, a tolerance of social dissent that set them apart. So I think free speech is wound up with democracy, with uh, with freedom, with equality. Uh, but but press freedom only really becomes an issue, of course, with the printing press, um, uh, and and uh, and and of course the Reformation sets off a, a very long and bloody distorted history, which has some parallels to the to the times that we live in today, uh, and we start to see calls for press freedom, which is initially just a, a call basically to say that there should be no pre-publication censorship, and one of the most famous appeals for that, of course, is John Milton's Areopagitica. Um, but in, in many ways, I think it's a little bit unfair that John Milton gets all the credit because, at the, because in, in fact, John Milton did not believe in, in press freedom for Catholics. He believed in burning books that were impious and, and other things. And I think that in this country, the levelers are much more deserving of, of the prize as the true champions of free speech because they not only did not believe in, uh, in, in pre-publication censorship, they also did not believe in, in sort of seditious libel laws that send a lot of of of, of, uh, of of critics uh, to 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 prison, but again, there with the levelers, you see that there's a they were also uh, in favor of representative uh, government, uh, universal male suffrage. Um, so you see this intimate connection between between uh, democracy and uh, and press freedom. And then I think um, there's another uh, element to press freedom and free speech, which which, which I think is really important to stress today because. A lot of people make the argument that free speech has become a weapon against the marginalized, against the oppressed. But uh, I argue in the book that that free speech and, and press freedom might actually be the most powerful engine of equality uh, that that human beings have ever stumbled upon, and it's been absolutely fundamental in uh, for for every oppressed group uh, and all uh, the, the groups that have been subjected to to oppression and, and discrimination throughout time, whether it were, they were racial minorities colonized people or women uh, and, and so on. Um, so, so, uh, so in that sense, I, I would say that press freedom is absolutely essential for, for democracy, for, for freedom. It becomes the bulwark of, of liberty as, uh, as, as an enlightened meme, enlightenment meme called it, um, but also for tolerance. Um, and ultimately it is also, I think, the antithesis of violence. It allows us to settle conflicts through dialogue through, through being pragmatic and compromising. But in order to, to be pragmatic and compromise, we need radical freedom to express uh, controversial ideas. Uh, so so that, that, that would be sort of my initial remarks. Great, thank you. Um, Inaya, does it, how does it look to you? Why, why define press freedom for, your, for you and, and, and why does it matter? Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me on this panel. And I'm really honoured and inspired, to be honest, to be on the panel with so many distinguished speakers. And I think uh, Jacob really set out a very clear and um, eloquent historical outline there. And I think I would associate myself and echo many of the things that he has said. But I do think, you know, from a very uh, simple definition, it is the right to express and communicate through published media, be that print, uh, or video or otherwise. And I think um, it is set out in various different international standards, but very simply, the government should not interfere with this freedom or censor media that is critical of, of state power. And I think um, within that, I think journalists therefore have often viewed themselves as 
engaging in the fearless pursuit of truth, highlighting opposing perspectives and exposing wrongdoing without fear or favor, ultimately holding the powerful to account. And I think that this is why uh, freedom of the press and journalism have been regarded or are regarded as rightfully so fundamental pillars of democracy. And I do think, um, as was already said, that I think it is intrinsically linked to freedom of speech, because as citizens, the presumption of democracy is that we are able and capable to weigh up competing information, um, look at a wide range of perspectives, come to our own conclusions and make up our own judgment. And I do think that that is uh, the liberal ideal within freedom of the press, that we all have our biases, uh, we get things wrong, but ultimately we are striving to create a, a more freer society. And that is the basis of uh, a liberal democracy to which press freedom is essential to that. So that's what I would summarize as what press freedom is. Thank you. And Mark, the same um, question. I, I, I want to agree with everything Jacob and Anaya have already said. So let, let me just add Terrible a outbreak of, of harmony here. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I'll try and break it if I can. Um, three, three, three kind of comments from me, really, um, very much in the spirit of what's just been said. It's worth saying that the freedom of expression, I, I think it, it, it's also, it, it's the freedom of impression. It's the right of the public to hear what they choose to hear and to make up their own minds about things. And, and, and so captured in this right is actually not just a handful of creators and journalists and, and, and the rest of it, it's actually, it's all humanity, it's every citizen and the, the right not to have someone decide on your behalf what you, what you can and can't look at. The other point, I, 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 again, I, I want to, um, uh, I guess, emphasize that the, the big threat to freedom of expression is always the government. It's those in political power. We have a, a, a real and actually also, I think, very important ongoing debate about the boundaries of um, what, as it were, appropriate um, to say in public? What are the bounds of debate on topics like um, uh, uh, identity and gender? What offends some people and, 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 and uh, or, or more than that is, is emotionally damaging to them and so forth? That debate also goes back hundreds of years. And I think it's quite important to say, although I think it is a very important debate, it's actually a slightly different one from uh, uh, um, the, the boundaries of what used to be called what you can say in polite society has always been an intensely, fiercely argued point with, you know, I mean, I, somebody once <laughs> tried to, when I was director general of the BBC, to um, open a criminal prosecution against me for blasphemy, for, for putting on the, the, the musical Jerry Spring of the Opera. I mean, it was the last, actually the last attempt in Britain to, 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 to launch a criminal prosecution. Um, that's really an example of, you know, taste, convention, offence. I think freedom of expression, I think of, is the, is the use of political power to stop the public having the freedom to choose what they want to see and hear and listen to, and the suppression of the right of individuals to be heard. And I want to say, although obviously these belong to the same family, I think they're very different debates. If I remember rightly, Gay News was prosecuted for blasphemy. It um, was. For a poem. Was it? It was. was and it I, can't, I, can't, I have to say, I can't remember. I think, I, I can't recall how that ended. Actually, it, it, they won. I mean, they won on appeal, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it may have bankrupted them. Anyway, they... they, but, the, they but the Jerry Springer uh, attempt at the prosecution essentially ended up with the appeal court essentially um, uh, abolishing... Um, uh, blasphemy, uh, blasphemy yeah. In, yeah. in its entirety. Yeah. So, so Marcus has stated very categorically that the biggest threat to press freedom is always government. Jacob, do you do you agree with that? Do you, do you see other threats? I I do actually. Um, I think that um, the culture of free speech is incredibly important. Um, so, um, you know, I talk about the Athenian democracy um, and there there was a, a tolerance of social dissent, which, which underpinned 
uh, free speech. And I think that, you know, if you go to John Stuart Mill, for instance, he warns in On Liberty, he warns as much about the tyranny of the majority and its, in, and its ability to impose its ideals on social dissenters, which may be as tyrannical as the tyranny of the magistrate. George Orwell says much the same. So, so, he, so his, his, his assessment, I think, of, of wartime censorship is that the, the British government was, was sort of not too bad. You know, you had, uh, you, you had a, a, you know, the BBC uh, did not engage in overt uh, propaganda and, and, and you had a, a gentleman sitting in Germany who, who, who spread propaganda into the to UK that, that, was not, that was not stopped. He was prosecuted and executed after the war, but, but nonetheless. Uh, but, but, but he says, or, or will warns against, for instance, the concentration of power uh, among uh, private owned uh, newspapers, uh, that that can be a threat uh, too. So for instance, if you have um, um, privately owned newspapers, you could, you, could, you could go to Hungary today uh, where you don't have uh, as oppressive laws as you have in Russia, but you have um, laws that concentrate ownership um, of, of media so that most uh, media are, are, are government friendly. Um, so, so that I think is also uh, problematic. And, and, and ultimately, I think the culture of free speech determines the limit, the, the, the legal limits uh, of free speech. So if you have a very intolerant society, civil society, that will likely reflect in laws that are also uh, intolerant and vice, uh, and, and, uh, and vice versa. So I think in that sense that the, that the laws and culture play together, and I wouldn't distinguish as sharply between the two as Mark perhaps uh, does. That, that's very helpful. And I, I definitely want to come back to, um, to some of those points, but just briefly, Naya, what, what do you, where do you see the biggest threat to press freedom today? from where you sit? Yeah, I think from an international perspective, I think governments remain the primary a threat to press freedom from many of those aspects that we've all become so familiar with, locking up journalists, criminalizing certain aspects of journalism, but also banning non-state backed media and so on. But I also agree with uh, what Jacob said about the culture um, of freedom. And I think particularly within Western society, um, there has been a, growing cultural problem of a kind of suspicion um, of freedom and democracy. And I do think that um, it's actually primarily driven um, from within the cultural, political and intellectual establishment itself, rather than necessarily from uh, the majority of people when we ask questions about a kind of wider um, cultural problem. And I do think that we, we see that in particular as was kind of briefly touched upon in, in relation to kind of questions of identity. So there has been a cultural elevation um, and almost a kind of sacralization, at least in my view, of, of certain identity groups, which I think has made it very difficult to, or, or, or the question as it's been related to identity groups has prioritized questions of harm over freedom um, or the, the capacity of either the identity group or the other person questioning that identity group to be able to uh, come to a, 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 a democratic solution on various different questions. So I think that that, that has been a really big problem. Um, and I also do think there has been a, a wider cultural problem of uh, a kind of technocratic mindset um, where, uh, for example, truth is known by a select minority and it's to be dished out um, to the, the masses, so to speak, um, rather than something to be uh, discovered or investigated in a kind of free um, and open way. And then I think on top of that as well, um, I do think social media and not just the so-called cancel culture and the debates around that, but also the ability um, of certain uh, big tech companies, for example, to be able to uh, suppress or increase the traction of certain stories. Um, when we have, for example, in the last two years, most of us have been locked up, that social media space often became the kind of digital public sphere. So their ability to do that in an unaccountable way has a genuine real impact on the public right. debate and a polit political implication. So I think there's cultural questions, um, yeah. big tech companies, but also a kind of elite suspicion of freedom and democracy that we've seen increasingly. Okay, that's that's interesting. I mean, I think we we maybe started off with a very 
I guess, a uh, romantic, slightly romantic view of, of press freedom and the noble, the noble journalist striving after truth. When um, I'm, I'm sometimes reminded that there was a, a, a little uh, um, saying about British journalists, which was, you cannot hope to bribe or twist the average British journalist, but given what the beast will do unbribed, there's no occasion to. I only throw that in um, just to, to <laughs> just in case we sound too self-congratulatory at this point. Um, but I think that a lot of um, questions have come up that I that I want to um, explore, and and the questions of ownership, of monopoly, of 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 um, prior of pre censorship, and perhaps we should maybe just go back quickly to the question of pre censorship, which is the obvious unfreedom, if you like. And I just want to suggest that there might be circumstances under which some pre censorship is permitted or even desirable. I mean, we we effectively have it in court cases. If a court case um, it, in a pending court case, you, you're not allowed to write about it being for fear of prejudicing. The outcome of the court case, um, the question of how you cover a war. Uh, you know, it, if you are a war correspondent, and certain there are very few wars in which you can cross lines. Small guerrilla wars, you 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 probably can, but larger set piece, the war in Ukraine, very hard to cross lines. And we are effectively getting one side of mm. that war, uh, which is the side I think probably most of us would wish to get, but nevertheless. There is another side uh, that we're not hearing. Jacob, you have written about this. You've written about the EU decision to ban Russian state media propaganda, for example. Mm -hmm. And you've been very critical about that. Do you want to just explain why you think that banning Russian propaganda in, in this moment of very acute and uh, war suffering, or, you know, with a, with a war that I think most of us would condemn. What, why should we listen to Russian propaganda? Well, if we were Ukraine, uh, I could understand it, uh, obviously, because it's the Ukrainians who are bearing the brunt of, of the war. Uh, the, the European Union is not officially at war with, uh, with, with Russia, and, uh, and, and so we're not uh, being uh, bombarded. But I think that, first of all, it sets a very dangerous principle when the EU almost overnight can, can decide not only to take away broadcasting licenses, but also uh, say to Google and social media platforms that no content from RT and Sputnik can be shared or, or, or found. Uh, so even if I want to debunk Russian propaganda, I can't do so, I can't, I can't share it. Uh, so so that, that seems to me a very, very dangerous principle. But I also think that it, it shows a lack of faith in the very citizens from, from whom these politicians derive their powers. You, I mean, if you don't trust the average citizen in a liberal open democracy in the West to be able to uh, discount Russian propaganda and find alternative sources, then really what, what, what was the basis of having a, a, a democracy? And, and then, you know, when you look at it, overwhelmingly, I think, Russian propaganda and disinformation has failed, you know, the vast majority of people in uh, in the West, not worldwide, but in the West are uh, very much on the side of, of Ukraine. And also, I think, you know, we, we have, uh, this is where I think social media is playing a, a very important role. We have people who work with open source intelligence who use uh, Russian information to, in real time, debunk Russian propaganda, document war crimes, show, uh, you, you know, use geolocation and so on to show why the stories coming out of the Kremlin simply are not true. Uh, and I think that's in, in, uh, in incredibly valuable. And in that, so in that sense, I actually think that free speech and access to information, going back to, to what Mark said, that, that, that right of, of also the public having access to, to information and being able to, to distinguish between uh, competing narratives is is uh, is a competitive advantage for open democracies, but vis a vis uh, vis a vis uh, authoritarian states uh, like like Russia. Well, you 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 say that we must trust the average citizen to distinguish between uh, false information, uh, between propaganda and truth, which is asking quite a lot of 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 the average citizen, to be honest. And and you also say 
um, in a, in that that social media has allowed. You talked about a fire hose of falsehoods and conspiracy theories, which originated from Donald Trump, amplified on TV networks and weaponized on social media, which was absolutely instrumental in fermenting, inciting, and coordinating the violence uh, in in the United States uh, over the contested election when yeah. the mob stormed the Capitol. So clearly, not every citizen can distinguish between good information and bad information. And should we really expect them to do that sort of forensic work when, after all, bad information can look pretty compelling? Yeah, uh, but first of all, I, I think it's important to distinguish between the, the, the Russian propaganda and then sort of the, the situation uh, in the US, which is so... Um, where, where tribalism, political tribalism, is really means that you have almost two nations that that that, that have their own sets uh, of uh, of facts. The problem, of course, is if you want it in the U.S. to if Democrats say, well, the the solution to to the fact that uh, a number of of Republicans now believe uh, or at least say that they believe that uh, Trump's election was stolen from him. Um, that is to regulate f false uh, information. Well, that was the exact thing, same thing that Donald Trump said when he was in office and he was being criticized. Uh, and so would Democrats have been fine with Donald Trump and a Republican dominated Congress adopting laws against false information when he was in power? I don't, I, I, I don't think they would. would and, and if they adopted a law and he came back into power in in, uh, in in 2024. Would they would they then be happy with the way that uh, it was being uh, that, that it was being enforced? Uh, uh, clearly not. Uh, so so that does not mean that free speech does not come with harms and costs. It certainly does. You know, go back to the printing press and the and the Reformation. But I think that very often uh, restrictions and censorship is a cure worse than the disease uh, when it comes yeah. to these uh, things. Uh, and you know. Uh, in in in, uh, in in this uh, country, you know, I'm not an avid follower of uh, of British politics, but it seems to me that there have been more than a few occasions in the past year or so where politicians have been caught lying, uh, and uh, <laughs> these are the same politicians then who want to uh, adopt laws defining uh, uh, what is true and false, and, and and wants to make those calls on on the behalf of of the population, uh, and and I think that. Is incredibly uh, dangerous uh, a precedent uh, to 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 set. Isabel, can, can I come in on off yes, the back of that briefly? Uh, uh, the first thing I want to say is we went from um, in your last question, but one from uh, court reporting, which is an example of an extremely narrow um, restriction on freedom of speech, um, in aid of another fundamental human right, which is the right to a fair trial, essentially. That's a very narrow case for, for, for pre-publication censorship to something much broader. Um, and I think really troubling. The, 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 the object of the exercise in having a right of freedom of expression is for the public to make up their own minds, not to make up their minds for them by interfering with the flow of information. That's called censorship. And the thing about censorship, it, it, it's almost always presented as if there are, there, it's kind of, it's justified by some, some other des des desideratum. So um, yesterday, um, President Obama was talking about disinformation and calling for regulation of the major digital platforms. Um, we know in many parts of the world, um, regulation of the digital platforms, meaning censorship in, 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 in given countries, is done explicitly because the government, repressive governments, are arguing it's a way of reducing disinformation. Uh, the Russian government at the moment is, is, is using the risk of disinformation as an argument for stopping Russian citizens hearing what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the impulse to control not to trust the public, they're sheep, they can't be trusted to make up their own minds, they must be helped by the removal of, of, of um, uh, socially untoward or politically un unacceptable content and spoon fed um, whatever the government chooses to give them. That is, that's, 
that's the particular um, pathology of, of censorship. And what's interesting is the impulse is very strong in Western governments as well. And I strongly agree with, with Jacob. It's really troubling that the, the moment the war starts, suddenly we're shutting down access to the Russian point of view. I think that's a really, that's a, in, it, you know, um, it's both at once politically and emotionally understandable, but really troubling. And that's really why I, I try and make this distinction between the very noisy and important debate we have about how we conduct conversations and arguments about really important topics and the moment when the government starts literally turning off the lights it, 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 theoretically in our interests can i can i just say something i i very much agree with you mark but and the, the troubling thing about um uh, social media laws in authoritarian states is that many of them have actually copy pasted the the german law from 2017 called the network enforcement act which is sort of the first way uh, the, the, the has you know Germany's way of trying to to cope with hate speech and, and and so on, and it said basically that social media platforms had to remove manifestly illegal content within 24 hours or risk huge fines, and that was then was then suddenly copy pasted by Russia, by Turkey, by the Philippines, by Venezuela, all these governments. Of course, they did it in bad faith. Of course, they don't have the same. Uh, safeguards uh, as they do in Germany, but it, it legitimizes authoritarian uh, uh, censorship. And right now, the, the, the European Union is, is finalizing the, the Digital Services Act, which is very much related to the, to, to the, to the uh, Network Enforcement Act, and which I, which I fear will, will again sort of legitimize uh, authority Because, you know, what do you say to someone like Putin uh, when, when, he, when he then adopts a similar but much more restrictive law then he says, well, you know, I'm just doing what they're doing in, in Germany. I'm doing what they're doing in, in Brussels. I'm doing what they're doing with the online safety bill uh, in London, even mm -hmm. though uh, obviously it's, it's, much, it's much more draconian than, than what, is, what is going on here. And I think it's important for, for democracies to have, you know, to be principled and, and, and to, so that you can show that dis, uh, fundamental distance and difference between open democracies and illiberal authoritarian states. Inaya. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the point that JP could have made about whether or not we were at war with Russia is an important one. I think that if um, we were at war, then I think that there is perhaps a legitimate case to be made to uh, prevent uh, enemy propaganda uh, across lines. But I think that we're, we're not at war. And I do think that whilst, um, as has already been mentioned, that there is uh, rightfully a grotesque, a condemnation of the grotesque um, invasion, that actually we should make sure that we don't compromise on our liberal ideals. And I think a, a station that has Russia Russia today in, in its uh, title, I think that we can perhaps assume that people would know that there is a slant to that and hopefully um, trust people to be able to make up their own mind. But I also think the point that there is a price to freedom. And I do think that that is important that well, and we have to weigh up or we weigh up that actually the price is worth paying. So similar with freedom of speech, that that might mean that people are offended or with freedom of the press, that might mean that sometimes information gets read or interpreted and that information may be wrong or, um, or may, may lead people to make the wrong conclusion. But the overall uh, benefit for having a, a free press or having freedom of speech is an open society where we are able to come to our own conclusions and we are able to pursue truth in a much freer way. So I do think that I don't want to diminish the fact that there is a price of freedom, but that price is worth paying for a free society. Well, I, I thank you for that. Although, um, Jacob, you, you quote Demosthenes as believing that free speech leads to truth. Um, I, it's very hard to say that social media today leads to truth. Uh, I mean, given, given the amount of disinformation, given the amount of ill intent um, that is behind a lot of what is disseminated on social media, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty difficult case to make, isn't it? I, I actually, you know, if you look at, at, at studies of, of disinformation and misinformation, you will see that compared to the media coverage, of it, um, it is it is much it, it's it's a much smaller share of the overall information, and actually those who are uh, 
most prone to fall prey to information are sort of partisans ideologues. So, so those who would fall for sort of um, uh, Trumpist propaganda would be those who were already, you know, um, part of the of, of, of the MAGA choir, if you if you like. Uh, so, so, so in fact, I think that ordinary people are less prone to be uh, gullible sheep uh, than uh, than they're being given credit for. But and 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 what is interesting here is that we we are actually seeing sort of a a reenactment of a very old conflict between an egalitarian conception of free speech with originating in Athens and a more elitist top-down uh, approach that originated in, in, in Republican Rome, where, where in, in Republican Rome, it was well-educated elites that, that, that uh, enjoyed free speech, and they were very suspicious of sort of allowing the unwashed mob to have a voice in, in public affairs the way that the Athenians had had. And, and you've, you see that throughout, uh, you see that throughout history, you see that very strongly in this country, actually, even into the into the to to the to first half of the nineteenth century, where 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 uh, you know people who called for 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 universal suffrage, who called for religious toleration, who want to give the the poor and propertyless a voice in, in public affairs, uh, are being uh, punished with draconian uh, pun punishments under under sedition laws, and and where very clearly the government uh, says that you know the reason why people are being punished, uh, publishers who sell uh, the works of Tom Paine to the lower classes is because you know the lower classes have to be protected uh, from these dangerous ideas, which will make them question the the social and political order. Uh, and 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 I think you know um, so, so that dynamic is is with us throughout throughout history. And and I think we all you know tend to to think of ourselves as particularly enlightened, and that our principles today are a sort of the pinnacle of truth and and. And, and, and morality, but uh, chances are that when we, when, when new generations look back at, at some of our dogmas in, in 50 or 100 years, they will say, oh, how, how on earth uh, could they believe uh, that? And, and why would they try to protect such ideas from, from being questioned? Well, uh, they might. And they, they might also um, be concerned in, in this country, at least, with the concentration of, of media ownership. Um, you know, that there are those who argue that that press freedom in Britain really only exists for those who are rich enough to own a newspaper. And uh, and there are a lot of um, newspapers are owned by very just a few rich people, many of whom don't live in this country, many of whom don't pay tax in this country. Um, is that Mark, would you would you consider the ownership structure of the British press conducive to a, a a, a, a plausible notion of press freedom, or is it is it a, a one yeah, of those I, hidden yeah, factors? But, say, that... but everyone's got the right to um, be heard, and actually, social media means that the means of production and distribution of your views is trivial. I mean, it's, it's, you need a you need a need a phone. Um, so you, you, you're right to express yourself. The the issue is, <laughs> do you also have a right, as it were, to be published everywhere? Um, uh, and to be heard everywhere, and, and I, I'm not sure that's a right in quite the same quite the same way. You know, I don't think we've all got the right to have our novel, you know, print a million copies printed and given to everyone because we're geniuses. It, it, we've always understood that you can shout in the marketplace, but frankly, other people may not be that interested in what you've got to say. Having said that, obviously, although I, I think it's slightly different from freedom of expression, open societies thrive when there's a reasonable plurality of perspectives and views. Um, and I, I think it's entirely reasonable that governments and others should have a care to the kind of the ecology of, 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 of the press and make sure that you don't get excessive concentration of ownership. And indeed, most countries in theory have you know, some level of oversight or regulation on this. And in practice, often governments are prey to various kinds of special pleading and close relationships with some media owners. And the reality never quite lives up to the ideal. Um, um, in much of the world, as you said, I'm, I'm co-chairing this new international fund for public interest media. This is an international fund to try and protect journalism around the world. In many countries, the political censorship and economic control absolutely go hand in hand. And there are many countries, for example, in Latin America, where um, 
advertising, public advertising is used as a weapon to concentrate revenue towards friendly mouthpieces and 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 uh, close kind of members of the elite who own very big newspaper and, and TV interests and away from awkward customers who start, you know, who, who do investigative journalism or, or write embarrassing things about political leadership. So I definitely think that in the practical matter of not just can you theoretically say what you want, but can a whole shade of opinion, a whole set of ideas be presented to a very broad section of the public, um, that a lot of that is, is, I think, is under threat in much of the world, and at least potentially in the threat in many European countries. So I have to say, in, 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 and in America, though most countries have either got reasonably um, effective commercial plurality, I argue the United States does have that, or they've got institutions like the public broadcasters, um, uh, the BBC, Channel 4, ITV in the UK, which are in fact a very strong counterbalance to, to the concentration of newspaper interests. They are, but I, I think you, you don't have to read many newspapers at the moment to understand that they're under threat. That both the threat of privatizing Channel 4, the threat of removing the license fee from the BBC, um, and the attacks on public broadcasting I, from I, I private interests I, I, are quite I, I, strong. I completely agree with that. And I, I would say that the, there's a perversity, of course, in, in public policy in the UK and many other countries, that at the very moment when commercial provision of journalism, particularly at a local and regional level, is under such economic threat, essentially for other reasons to do with digital disruption, at a time when actually the commercial models for providing um, well-reported news about what's going on in the world is under threat, that far from strengthening, as it were, you know, collectively funded public provision of these things, the politics mean that the, the public broadcasters are being kind of they're trying to squash them down at the same time. So I agree, it's completely perverse public policy. Inaya, when you look at the at the structure of ownership of the of the press in in Britain, and we have many many test testimonials to the editorial interference from the proprietor, you know, from Harry Evans uh, at the Sunday Times and the Times talking about Rupert Murdoch to, you know, the the the, the Barclay brothers, you know, insistence on on various kind of economic and tax policies. What what do you think that says about the state of press freedom in this country? I think the important question is plurality. So I think that, for example, we having, don't have it. Well, I think having a public funded broadcaster, but then also having uh, privately owned media. And now with the rise of social media, there is uh, a democratization of information where there is also an increase in people utilizing new media platforms and even self-publishing platforms uh, such as Substack, uh, Medium and so on. And even those, they, they have their own set of challenges. So for example, you know, they, they often don't have editorial oversight. They can often uh, create their own echo chambers and people uh, often just publish things that they know will, will, will drive clicks. But I think the importance really um, is plurality. And I think that oftentimes now what we are seeing is the uh, um, traditional media responding to the changes, for example, within the media and try and having a conversation between them. And therefore, I think as long as there, that there is that plurality, then I do think that's important. But I do agree that um, it, I, I think that the challenges to the license fee and questions around the future of Channel 4 um, do potentially threaten that plurality. But there is also an argument to say that in the free market as well, that if they, are able, they should be able to survive if they are creating uh, content, other people are arguing that they should be competing with um, other international platforms. I don't think that just because it is going private that that necessarily means that that threatens them. But I think the important thing as we do have, I think, broadly speaking in the UK, is that plurality. The biggest threat, I would say, is from the closing down or, or the, uh, the lack of funds from often local media, um, which I think is a really big problem. And I think that local media um, and regional media closing down would be a, 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 big, a big threat to journalism as a whole.
Well, what's happening mostly with local media in, in, in Britain, at least, is a concentration of power again, rather than closing down. So, so you're getting big monopolies that own uh, most of the local media and are stripping out the local news content. So that's an example of the market working. But it's but do you do you think that the market and the public interest are always aligned in terms of 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 press freedom and the ability of of the media to deliver uh, what is in the public interest? No, I don't necessarily think that that is always aligned, but I think that it goes back to the earlier point that I think that if we live in a society that values uh, a culture of freedom and certain liberal ideals within a democracy, uh, we would be striving for that. But I think right now we are living in a culture of tribalism and polarization. And therefore, oftentimes the incentive, incentive structures are optimized for content that um, ex effectively exacerbates that polarization. So I think that the questions have to come as a society as a whole about what we choose to value um, and whether or not these liberal ideals still hold cultural authority and how we rearticulate them for that to be the starting point um, rather than um, a, another starting point. I think it, it's a, a cultural and democratic question about how we rebuild those trusts within liberal ideals for those questions to be answered. Jacob, that question of, of the ability of ambitious men to sway the assembly with seductive rhetoric, uh, again, going back to, to ancient Greece, it, do you think that there is any, uh, you know, what are what are other guardrails that we can erect without compromising uh, on the freedoms that you argue for so passionately to protect the public interest from demagoguery, from the kind of um, exploitation of fear or the exploitation of emotion that can have such bad the, the, the kind which gives the, the the social and political results that Anaya has just highlighted we're living in a tribal societies where the tribes are fiercely at war that's been in many ways created by uh, this free for all in information and misinformation surely yeah, I think it, it, it starts early on, really. Um, you know, what kind of education do we want to give uh, our children? Do we want to, to, to emphasize uh, the importance of, of, of looking at, uh, at, at problems from, from different sides, uh, to, to, to emphasize the importance of give, getting different perspectives, to emphasize that disagreement uh, is not uh, a bad thing, uh, that, that, you know, should not be seen as a threat, but should be seen as, as valuable. Uh, that when, when people have different perspectives, they're not necessarily a, a threat or, or a harm. Um, so, so that is something I think we need to stress in in, in, in our education. That 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 is absolute. That underpins sort of the, the culture uh, of free speech. I also think there's a lot we can do with uh, with design of of social media platforms. So it's le less about sort of regulating content, what I, what, one of the things that I hope to see is a more decentralized social media uh, environment, um, uh, so, so, um, which I think might um, create a healthier ecosystem of, uh, of, of information uh, than we have today. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, I don't think we'll ever um, live in, in a society which is at the same time free and and without um, uh, you know heated disagreements, um, that that is sort of built into to the whole concept. And sometimes those disagreements will boil over and will lead to uh, to real harms. Uh, that is uh, unfortunately uh, unavoidable. Uh, that 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 is simply um, part of the price that we pay. Um, and but I think in the societies that we live in today, because in consolidated democracies, few of us have really faced sort of old, uh, old fashioned authoritarian censorship. We tend to take all the benefits of free speech for granted and, 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 and sort of obsess about the harms real and perceived. So the fact, <clears throat> you know, that we can have this discussion uh, now today um, you know that, that uh, and and you can say very critical things about the government in this place and 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 in other places. That is not something that we could have done uh, 
um, in, in, in large parts of, of, of human history, yet we don't think of it, I think, most of us who, who are on this panel now, we don't think of it as exercising our free, right to free speech. It's just something that we take for granted. It, it might even be sort of a, a, a mundane part of our professional lives to, to engage in, in, in these uh, debates, but it's incredibly valuable, not because we're geniuses, but the fact that we can have these uh, discussions, but yet we take them uh, uh, for granted. Well, perhaps we shouldn't be quite so um, convinced that uh, we, we can take it for granted. There's a case, after all, um, which is a, a long running case in this country um, against the founder of WikiLeaks, the publisher of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, um, who has been in prison um, awaiting a decision on an, an extradition request from the United States. Where were he to be extradited, he would face um, 17 charges, I believe it is, um, which would add up where he convicted to more than 170 years in prison. Um, a number of free speech organizations and press organizations have written to the Home Secretary um, to, uh, on whose desk this, this case now rests, uh, pointing out that there is no public interest defense for one of the charges that he would face, um, which they would argue, they do argue, is, is a serious threat to free speech and they urge her not to grant the extradition. Um, I, I just wonder if you, know, you consider there are any circumstances after all, what, what Assange did was to publish uh, leaked government documents, a large numbers of leaked government documents. Are governments entitled to keep secrets? Are governments entitled to punish those who leak their secrets? Are governments entitled to punish those who publish those leaked secrets under any circumstances? Inaya, perhaps you could start. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is a difficult question. I do think that um, there are clearly, you know, some circumstances for uh, very serious security reasons, for geopolitical reasons, um, that where governments do um, have that right and ability to, and we know when it comes to issues of counterterrorism um, and so on. But we also recognise the importance of, of whistleblowers and those that if they do think that there is something that crosses that boundary to the um, extent where wrongdoing is going on, particularly um, under the assumption within society that that is, is going on. And if they if people had known about that, they would not have been supportive of it. Then we have a situation where um, people come forward as whistleblowers in order to reveal information. And I think that it is fundamentally important um, that those people are protected, even though it may um, pose a risk, security or otherwise, um, to other people or society if that information came out. And I think it is right for these organizations to uh, take a stand against what's happening to Julian Assange. What he essentially did, at least in my view, was publish information um, that was true, but it effectively just embarrassed uh, the US government. And I also think um, it really reveals the hypocrisy um, of how, when we rely on government solely, uh, to be the arbiters of acceptability when it comes to freedom, what happens? We have this government that is trying to uh, regulate social media under the guise of um, freedom, um, you know, trying to regulate universities under the guise of protecting free speech and so on. And, and now um, a, a government that positions itself as a defender of freedom, um, effectively uh, putting freedom of the press on trial uh, by... Uh, accepting the extradition of a journalist who um, did something that many journalists do uh, all the time. So I do think that um, I do think under certain certain circumstances, uh, for security reasons, counterterrorism, and so on, it may be justified. But I do think protecting whistleblowers and those that expose wrongdoing is just as essential. Oh, Mark. Well, I, mean, I agree with that completely. Um, and I think governments, I think, are entitled to, to keep secrets, but one good place to start is to actually keep them. Um, in other words, to make sure that you keep them secure, um, uh, which is in this case, they obviously failed, failed to do. The Indeed. reason that so many um, 
organizations like Reporters Without Frontiers, but also um, many of the really big uh, journalistic organizations I know are so exercised is because of the 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 indictment under the uh, an archaic and hardly ever used law the the um, 1917 uh, um, uh, espionage act in the US um, is really a, a straightforwardly um, itemizing and indicting Assange for journalistic activity. You can debate whether Julian Assange himself is a is a, is a journalist or not, but the activities which this seeks to define as criminal are things that at the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian and the, and the Times of London, rest of it, journalists do all the time. Um, now, ultimately, you know, potentially this could, if, if it all happened, this could end up in the Supreme Court and the testing of the Espionage Act against the First Amendment of the Constitution could happen. But, but, but it, it, it's obviously repressive. And we know that national security Almost everyone would accept some level of cutout on, on, on freedom of expression for national security. Um, for all sorts of obvious reasons, national safety is, a, is, is itself and the right you know, to, be, to be kept safe um, 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 from, from war. Is but it, it's where involved. that line is drawn, surely, is the and issue. It, 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 because the national it, it, security is invoked by every rogue regime there is. Exactly, rogue. exactly. And the Espionage Act of 19, 1917 is not an attempt to narrowly define it. Now, I have to say, I, I was actually, I got a ringside seat for um, parts of the Edward Snowden story. And actually, I thought the, the way actually that played out, what was interesting, Snowden had been very measured in how... Um, uh, he wanted the material he got to be released, and um, not in the UK, where there's a lot of you know the, the re relations between government and intelligence services and, and, and journalists are not not really they're better than they were, but they're still not great. In the US, there is a there's a tried and tested way in which newspapers like the New York Times will will literally talk a story through with the CIA or the FBI, um, uh, uh, NSA, whoever it is, and literally ask for. Is there anything in this story which you can argue to me now is going to put the life of an agent or the life of some individual at risk or in some other fundamental way damage American national security? Tell us and we will bear that in mind before we decide on publication. And so there's a kind of there's a process of kind of a kind of vetting whether the right to publish is held by the newspaper and they go ahead and publish if they if they choose to, but that at least they make sure they've listened to the case. For now, that strikes me as an adult way through this, um, with the with the as it were the criminal sanction kept as narrow as humanly possible. But there's, there is so, the governments should be able to have secrets. Uh, they need to do a very good job, better and better, because it's getting harder and harder in keeping the secrets. But this 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 particular persecution of Julian Assange, I don't say it's with any particular personal sympathy for Julian Assange, that's irrelevant. And the number of years he might serve is irrelevant, runs the risk of criminalizing journalism. We, I, I should have encouraged the, um, uh, our audience to uh, send some questions and some, some questions have come in. Do please um, send us your questions. We'd love to hear from you. I, I just want to um, pick up on one um, from Stuart Mitchell, which goes back to this question of the emergence of internet news media and, and uh, new media. And he asks if we think that represents a healthy extension of free speech and news gathering, or whether it brings with it unique and dangerous pitfalls. Inaya, you're very much in that world. Do you mm -hmm. see pitfalls? Do you see it as an untrammeled extension of free speech? Or are there dangers that of such as we've perhaps touched on in the discussion? Yeah, I think I think that there, there are benefits and there are drawbacks. I mean, some of the drawbacks uh, has been, for example, the debate that happened uh, a few months ago around Joe Rogan and his podcast that has millions of listeners and subscribers, but he doesn't uh, consider himself a journalist. And so what editorial standards or otherwise do we hold people that set up a, a platform uh, are doing, some might argue, journalistic work by interviewing significant figures and asking them questions that may well change uh, the public mind about how they might act in the world. 
um, what what standards do they can they be held to? How do we hold them accountable? And so on. And I do think when people are self-publishers um, and have a platform where they are as just an individual, the entire platform, that does raise uh, massive questions um, and, and difficulties and challenges when their platform becomes very, very, very big. Um, and also, I think there is a danger in new echo chambers. I think some of the reasons why I think some people uh, believe that the new media is the, the platform that they chose to, to do journalistic work is because they felt that they it was too stringent um, or, or too to conformists under certain institutions, but do we want to create new echo chambers rather than actually ensure that the major institutions that speak to the public as a whole, not just a minority of people, um, are, we make sure that there's diversity of opinion um, within those institutions. So I do think it's great to have a plurality. And I think when we do have a, uh, situations like Brexit or Trump, where um, people wanted to hear different perspectives, it's good that they can find them. But we do know that during the pandemic, uh, it is the mainstream media that will be asking the prime minister questions. It's often, if rarely, it's never going to be uh, people that are on YouTube, generally speaking. So I do think uh, the mainstream institutions are just as important and still central and important to to actually holding the powerful to account. But on the question of, of echo chambers, you did um, touch um, earlier on, on on the ability of um, Facebook, I think in particular, to, uh, to determine what people see or to skew what people see mm. and, and a whole sort of myriad algorithms determine that your experience on Facebook might be different from my experience on Facebook based on what we have looked at before. Surely that whole thing creates echo chambers and the evidence is that, that people are led to you know, particular points of view and they're then reinforced by, by the algorithm rhythms. Is that something you would like to see regulated? It's not a regulation of free speech, but it is a regulation of how people are, are exposed to, uh, to a, a body of opinion. Would you like to see those algorithms subject to regulation? Um, I, not really, because I do think that, you know, th that there's some benefits to... But they're creating uh, exactly the uh, echo chambers yeah. you say you don't like. Well, uh, well I, th I think there's some, also some benefits to, for example, having, you know, curated content personalized to you you know if you if you are interested in certain subjects if you're interested in certain um ideas you can do that as an individual who's making the choices that we've all been arguing for with the sophistication that we've been assuming in the in the consumption of information why can't an individual net user be trusted to find his or her own content why does an unseen well, I, hand well, have to serve it up well, I, I don't think people are prevented necessarily from still looking into other content um, if they want to. But I do think it, it goes back to what I said earlier, is that I think that uh, we we uh, start to demand a kind of regulation when there is a sense of a kind of lack of control and a breakdown of perhaps trust in certain foundational ideals. And I do think that if we there was more confidence as a society um, in mainstream institutions as well, then and a, a, a sense that there was a sense of cohesion um, around certain foundational principles that I think we would be less nervous if, you know, someone on Facebook was seeing, you know, content from an algorithm. I think it's because we've had this polarization that we're much more anxious about what people are seeing because we don't trust one another anymore. So I do think we've got to um, sort out the first problem without thinking that just regulating what people see is going to be the solution. And we've seen that happen already. So, for example, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram now, oftentimes they have pop ups um, when it comes to certain kinds of uh, information and that are they regard as not trustful. And oftentimes it isn't. But oftentimes those people that are looking at that content also feel less trusting when they see that a social media company is telling them that this information you know, it is not trustworthy. So I don't think there's a simple solution. And I think the assumption that regulation will be this kind of silver bullet, um, I don't, it doesn't seem to bear out with what we've seen over the last couple of years. Mark, another question um, has picked up on, on your comment that the threat to um, press freedom comes from governments. 
um, and point out that attacks on journalists online and in life are, are really a substantial problem. Um, according to Reporters Without Borders, the number of journalists murdered for doing their job um, doesn't give a year, um, but over a thousand journalists. So, yes, so, I believe that number, yeah. Yeah, the question is then, are governments also implicated in this figure? And, and what do you think should be done about it? Yes, I mean, not, not unique, uniquely in all societies, but um, uh, very substantially, most of the journalists who, who are, uh, are being uh, murdered, um, we're now in the Duterte regime in the Philippines, for example, it's something like 25, 26, 27, maybe more now. Uh, journalists murdered, are being murdered in the context of a regime which is actively, actively, and indeed in the president's mouth, publicly calling for violence against journalists. Uh, and that business of, of governments condoning and conniving at the, the harassment, and in some cases, the murder of, of, of journalists, is very widespread around, around the world. And even in our democracies, um, uh, Mr. Trump, when he was president, his, his you know, the demonization of journalists as the, as the enemies of the people um, um, uh, also creates an environment which can, and it arguably in a few cases, not many to be fair in America, in a few cases did lead to, to violence. So, so um, governments don't tell the whole story. I mean, there is a whole world of politics and majorities and minorities with very strong views and we know that that journalists have also been under pressure for example from from people who have very very strong religious views uh, um, uh, and so on um so so there are there are many dimensions there are many people the list of enemies of journalism is not exhausted just with governments it, the point is governments have the kind of systematic controls and powers they can they can apply to uh, to stop journalists say what what they what they do one if i can say very briefly just um, yes. um I, 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 listening to anaya it, 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 and your question to her it's the thing is a new technology for media plus kind of deep anxiety anyway about 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 media often leads to kind of a period of real panic um, Hobbes in Milton's time thinks the Civil War, the English Civil War in the 17th century, is significantly sparked by pamphleting. And his basic answer is, you know, basically hang the people who write the pamphlets and then you'll have peace. Um, George Orwell becomes obsessed with the dangers of radio. And in particular, he particularly thinks of, of the BBC's radio service, which is now Radio 4, as a sinister force. Now, it's regarded as kind of, you know, apple pie and, and, and all the rest of it. But then in the 30s, this insidious, these insidious voices in the corner of the room were regarded as... So I think the idea of kind of a period of normalisation, in this case of, 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 of social media and other, other forms of digital media, where we kind of, we all make sense of it and calm down about it. Um, pamphlets in the, in the 17th century start a civil war in the 18th century, People are using them to wipe their bottoms, and the idea of another political pamphlet—you don't take it that seriously anymore. The fact that it's printed doesn't mean it's true, but it takes time to absorb new new media technologies. And part of, I think, what we're living through is a transition where we don't fully, at a kind of human level, we haven't entirely kind of digested what this new media and how unimportant it is in some respects. Well, on on that uh, on that subject, um, Jacob. Um, Leila Bolton comments on the um, on the threatened takeover of Twitter by uh, by Elon Musk, and um, of course one of Twitter's more uh, noted uh, moves was to ban Donald Trump. Um, if Elon Musk were to take over Twitter and implement his vision of freedom of speech by lifting the ban on Donald Trump. The question is, is that a plus or a backward step for free speech? Um, she goes on to ask if unlimited freedom to spout falsehoods is part of free speech or a mortal threat to it. I suspect I know what you're going to answer to that one. <laughs> well, I, th I thought actually that at the time when Trump was uh, banned for not calling back his supporters, uh, I, I thought it was uh, a reasonable decision because uh, 
there was a clear and present danger to the peaceful transfer of power in a, in, in a democracy. And, and uh, that obviously is, is not something to be taken lightly. But I, thought, I, I think that it, sort of the indefinite suspension and, and and some of the platforms that banned him did it without any real basis in their in their terms of service i think uh, was problematic and you know you, if you go through the whole list of world leaders who are on twitter i promise you you can find uh, world leaders on, on on twitter who have said much more outrageous things than, than trump and also incited violence against minorities and and, and uh, sit on, on top of of uh, of autocracies uh, and so on. So, the, so, so that if, if Trump is deemed uniquely dangerous, um, I, th I think that uh, had more to do with with, with sort of specific uh, dynamics in the West and in, and, and in particular in the US. Now, I think that um, Elon Musk, um, I think he will find it very difficult to return Twitter to its position, it, it once ca called itself the free speech wing of the free speech party. And then, you know, I think it was in 2017, uh, they were summoned before the British parliament and, and they sort of gave up their John Stuart Mill philosophy, I think one of the ex executives uh, said. And, and that's just because, you know, take the, uh, you know, if you want to operate uh, in, in the European Union after the Digital Services Act is, is, is implemented, you will have to uh, remove uh, so-called illegal content and that will create huge incentives for platforms to uh, to use automated uh, content uh, uh, moderation to remove lots of uh, lots of content, um, and you know if he pays a gazillion dollars for the to 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 own Twitter, I think he will also um, quickly realize that once he opens up the floodgates of of content, there will be uh, pressure from advertisers and a lot of users might threaten to walk away, and then we'll see just how principled uh, he is, and then just. That there is that fact that content moderation at scale is just it's impossible to to do it, to to do well uh, you that, that will that will always be you will always draw the line somewhere where some constituency thinks you you're doing it wrong which is one of the reasons why I'd like to see a more decentralized um, social media environment and also one where users have more control over over content rather than sort of this movement towards more centralized top-down uh, ecosystem of, of, of information on, on these huge platforms. But you do think that there is such a thing as, as undesirable content or content that shouldn't... I mean, oh, death threats, yeah, for yeah, example, yeah. which, yeah, death, which yeah, I'm sure we've all had. No, um, de, de, but I, uh, I've never found that Twitter responded at all. They said, looked at them and said, well, they don't breach our guidelines, which is yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, and, and, but, and again, it's, it's, you know, because context matters so much, you know, when is a when is a death threat credible? Um, uh, uh, so 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 these uh, you know and 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 these companies are expected to make decisions within hours or or days. Uh, you know, my organization we 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 looked at how five European countries. How long did it take for a hate speech case to reach a decision in in the first instance? And on average, I think it was more than a sub seven hundred days. Then go to the German law, and uh, that, that I mentioned before. And they give them 24 hours, uh, um, you know, to 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 make a, a, a similar decision on on hate speech. So, so that you know, um, just just shows how difficult it is. Um, sometimes I think, um, you know, uh, we all criticize these social media uh, platforms, and often with good reason. But often we also just, uh, I think, are unaware of how impossible a situation it is to 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 moderate content at scale when you have platforms with uh, 2.7 billion uh, people and you know uh, hundreds of different languages and you have to take into account you know context humor uh, and, and 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 so on very very difficult job one of the things i learned last night is that the british library is also um, collecting digital content so perhaps we can look forward to an exhibition based on digital content when when anyone figures out how to do that um just because we we're, we're coming very close to the end of this very rich discussion and we have been talking on the basis of an exhibition that has explored this very long and and fascinating history of of press freedom uh, or the struggle for press freedom. So I, I just want to ask each of you, if you were to, you know, look in the next decade, say, do you feel 
confident on current trends that press freedom is relatively safe? Do you see it as a as a declining or or a or a rising asset? Inaya, are you are you feeling good about press freedom for the next decade? Mm, I think it depends where. From from which country? Clearly. Let's let's go to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think from the UK, possibly. I think I was a bit worried um, when GB News um, was launching, and there was a campaign, you know, stop funding hate um, to try and get it uh, got rid get rid of it before it was even launched. But actually, since then, you know, even in the next few days, a new uh, broadcasting station is launching. Um, talk TV. So I do think that there seems to be a demand for for more conversations, more investigations, more plurality. And with the new, with the internet, we've seen lots of new online publications um, that are launching. Um, and are you feel are, it's in safe hands for now, at least. I think Mark, so. Mark, are you confident? Well, firstly, internationally, globally, uh, it's one of the reasons that Maria and I are involved in the International Fund to try and at least support the economics of journalism around the world. Internationally, I think the, the trajectory is very negative and we, we know we all hope in different ways to do something to help reverse it and maybe there'll be a change in the wind and it'll reverse itself. But at the moment, globally, I think the situation is, is, is the bleakest of my lifetime, actually, probably. Um, in, at home, I don't know. I mean, just after he got elected, Donald Trump came to lunch rather bizarrely at the New York Times and I, I asked him on the record whether um, uh, he was going to defend the First Amendment, um, given what he'd said about, about the media. And he said, uh, I, I think you'll be all right. And actually, my view about America and the UK is the institutional safeguards are quite deep and strong. And although it always feels like it's, it's under grave threat, actually, I think actually in, in, in Western Europe and America, I think it will be all right, probably. Jake, am I going to have to ask for a, a yes or a no? Are you confident? Just because we're running out of time. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a pro- professorial response. <laughs> but on balance, we seem to be feeling fairly good about it. Um, I, my warm thanks to all of you, to Anaya, to Mark, to Jacob, to all of you online, and to the British Library for hosting us for this uh, for this great discussion and for the wonderful exhibition. Thank you all for watching and good night.